Day 785 of the Ukrainian war map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian war. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So, starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses as currently Russia sits on more than 457,000 military personnel losses, which represents an additional 870 in the past day. Then as for hardware losses, 9 tanks, 17 APVs, 21 artillery, and 1 aircraft that just missed the reporting cutoff. So, we'll go to the map now and have a look exactly at that one. As in the Stavropol region of Russia, a Russian Tu-22M aircraft, which in fact was believed to have attacked Ukraine last night, crashed under some potentially mysterious circumstances. Some Russian telegram channels suggested that the strategic missile launching aircraft may have been mistakenly shot down by Russian air defences after being taken for a Ukrainian drone. Although, some other reports suggest that the Ukrainian Air Force instead had something to do with this latest event. But then we saw images and footage of the Tu-22 aircraft plummeting from the sky in a fiery flat spin before impacting the ground outside Stavropol just this morning. So the exact cause of the crash remains unclear, but the incident raises more ongoing questions about the effectiveness of Russian military coordination and communication. But as for a bit of added context, the Tupolev Tu-22 is a long-range strategic and maritime strike aircraft, mostly of Soviet vintage, and with this one believed to be the latest M3 variant that incorporated some more modernised avionics and engine, uh, engines among other things. Now the full numbers of Russia's available Tu-22 aircraft are not officially known, but it is expected that Russia has approximately 60 across Russia's entire available fleet. But the fleet size can vary due to the age and condition of many within the fleet. So we're possibly looking at half this number or less of operationally ready aircraft. It should also be noted that consistent usage of the airframes, particularly over the past two years, could have taken a significant toll on its actual total operable numbers as well. Plus, of course, we also know about a few that Russia called only slightly damaged after some attacks on Russian airfields last year. Though, of course, some of those were completely obliterated. Then, moving across just northwest of here, the Kamansk Chemical Plant, a key facility producing solid rocket fuel for ballistic missiles in Russia's Rostov region, came under attack from unidentified drones, as reported by Russian media. The assault ignited a fierce blaze within the plant's structure, threatening to disrupt the production of vital components for Russia's missile arsenal. But in fairly standard practice, authorities attempted to downplay the severity of the incident, falsely attributing the fire to mere broken windows. And so this reminds me how Russia's greatest gift ever bestowed on them is the size of their country which has now started to be and will continue to be one of their biggest weaknesses in this war, as this brazen strike underscores the vulnerability of Russia's air defences and raises questions about the efficacy of its security measures, as they simply have too much airspace to protect. Then further into the map, floods continue to cause chaos in Russia, and this time in the Kurgan Oblast as the local dam succumbed to leaks submerging thousands of buildings beneath the surging waters. And as the deluge expands its reach, Russian authorities face criticism for prioritising of the investing into the ongoing war over that of the welfare of their own citizens. Take for example, one such Russian woman expressed shock on social media at the deafening silence from authorities in the face of these events. And with homes submerged and lives upended, she believes the time has come for a change in leadership, flat out calling for Putin's resignation. They are some dangerous words to speak in a country like Russia. But presuming she lost everything, then at this point she doesn't have a lot left to lose. But it's not just Putin's undivided attention on invading their neighbour that's a problem. It's also the systemic corruption that reaches all the way down to the local level as well. 
As take for instance the mayor of the flood-stricken Russian city of Orsk, Mayor Kozupika, faces scrutiny after purchasing a luxury apartment in Dubai last month, of all times to do it, and who also has a son that fled to Saudi Arabia following the start of mobilization in Russia. So as for the luxury apartment in Dubai, given that Putin himself only earns the equivalent of about 120,000 US dollars per year, officially, of course his grip on power has amassed him a lot more wealth than that, then also officially a regional mayor shouldn't be able to buy luxury anything almost anywhere, especially in Dubai. Then we'll head across to the Ukrainian map today as fierce battles continue to rage along the Novo Bakhmutivka and Novo Kalinova axis, as Russian forces made some strategic advances there. So for instance, geolocated footage revealed enemy troops pushing along railway tracks at flanking Novo Bakhmutivka to reach the fringes of Ocheritina. Although, as with the date map, arguably a, now this is going back in time a day right there, then going back forward, a small loss of land for the Russian forces, it seems to be, in follow-up to their previous day's acquired positions. Although it must be said that the fate of a crucial electricity substation in Ocheritina hangs in the balance as fighting intensifies. And then in a parallel offensive, the Russian infantry has breached the perimeter of Novo Kalinova engaging in close quarters combat now. And fair to say that with the enemy gaining ground in Novo Kalinova, the Ukrainian defenders would face mounting pressure to maintain their hold on these positions. Then taking a look around, as somewhere in the east, uh, Ukrainian SFO, or the Special Operation Forces, destroyed a Russian ammunition depot and also took out a towed D30 122mm Soviet caliber uh, howitzer in the process. Then also in the east, an unsuccessful attempt by the Russian military to storm the positions of the armed forces of Ukraine near to Avdivka, this one was, on two Chinese Desert Cross 3 buggies. Although that footage might be perceived as a little too spicy for TV, I would think. Just as a war zone is too spicy for buggy soft targets. Then also we saw the destruction of the Russian anti-aircraft missile uh, system, the, the Strela-10. So two FPVs, one started it off and the other just finished it off. Then headed across to a bit of news for today. So in a significant development, Belgian Prime Minister Alexander de Croo has announced that the first F-16 fighter jets, complete with trained Ukrainian pilots, will arrive in Ukraine before the onset of summer. So this expedited delivery timeline underscores the urgency of bolstering Ukraine's air defense capabilities because these aircraft will play a crucial role in countering aerial threats as, well, to simplify, it's like getting extra air defense systems. As the F-16s are renowned for their exceptional anti-air prowess. Oh, and this is a channel-worthy mention. Russian propagandist Sladkov suggested that the F-16s going to Ukraine will be manned by Anglo-Saxons and private mercenaries in particular. Ah, those pesky Anglo-Saxons, they're always up to something. Then in some other news, as Russian escalates attacks on Ukrainian cities and infrastructure, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has expressed hope that NATO countries can provide Ukraine with six additional Patriot air defense systems. So during the Special European Council Summit in Brussels, Scholz called on allies to make similar decisions to Germany's recent commitment to a third Patriot system. Then in some related developments, German Vice-Chancellor Robert Habeck made a surprise visit to Kyiv, accompanied by Helmut Rauch, head of Dial Defense, which manufactures IRST air defense systems. Those are the German ones. Subsequently, Habeck met with President Vladimir Zelensky to discuss Ukraine's air defense needs, with Rauch confirming more IRST deliveries this year. Then in some more news, Ukrainian drone strikes targeting Russian oil refineries have dealt a significant blow to the country's diesel exports. According to Bloomberg, data from Kelper, an analytics firm, reveals that Russia's diesel exports plummeted by 25% in the 10 days leading up to April 13th, 
compared to the same period over the past four years. And this is, of course, due to the relentless onslaught of drone attacks, which has successfully hit multiple, multiple Russian oil refineries across many regions of Russia, including a brazen strike on one of the nation's largest facilities in Nizhnykamsk of Tatarstan, over a thousand kilometers from the Ukrainian border. As such, the strikes continue to cripple Russia's oil industry, and the repercussions are felt in the nation's dwindling diesel exports now. Then in some more news, and in a significant geopolitical move, Argentina has taken the initial step towards establishing a partnership with NATO following in the footsteps of Sweden and Finland. The South American nation has formally submitted a request to become a global partner of the military alliance. And the Argentine Defense Minister met with the NATO Deputy Secretary General at the alliance's headquarters to discuss the potential partnership. The talks centered around the framework and requirements for Argentina to forge closer ties with the 32-member organization. However, the path to a formal partnership is not without hurdles. Any decision to grant Argentina global partner status would require unanimous approval from all NATO member states. The process is likely to involve extensive negotiations and diplomatic efforts to secure a consensus among the diverse alliance. But as Argentina embarks on this journey, it marks a significant shift in its foreign policy and a desire to align more closely with the Western military bloc, which could likely have a later flow-on effect or implications that could reshape the geopolitical landscape in South America and beyond. Then in some other news, in a significant development, the G7 group of countries are exploring the possibility of using frozen Russian assets as collateral to provide loans to Ukraine, as reported by Reuters yesterday. European Commission Executive Vice President Dombrovsky revealed that several options are under consideration with the final plan likely involving collateralizing the assets rather than confiscating them. Which is a clever idea, being that it's legally difficult to confiscate, say, $300 billion worth in frozen Russian assets all of a sudden. But if the expectation is there that those funds will be released one day, then using those assets as a form of security or guarantee for obtaining loans or other financial instruments in support of Ukraine, then it's a faster pathway to aid Ukraine. And by aid Ukraine, I also mean go to Europe and the States for purchase of all types of goods to assist Ukraine's defense and recovery, thereby propping up local industry in those regions. See, everybody wins. Except Russia, of course. Then headed across to another Russian military mobilization blunder segment, guys. So a little bit of a different one, but uh, in a cruel twist of fate, all the way in Buryatia, Russia, which is located a staggering 7,000 kilometers from the battlefields of Ukraine, a Russian soldier and resident returned home from the war only to discover that his house had been completely ransacked by thieves. The audacious robbers left no stone unturned, even going so far as to steal the man's toilet. So what is going on? So, so Russians aren't just stealing toilets in Ukraine, they're stealing them from Russian houses too. So as the man surveyed the, the wreckage of his looted home, he has been left grappling with a profound sense of disillusionment and betrayal, and questions the very fabric of society. Wondering how, after risking his life in a foreign conflict, he could be so callously victimized by his own countrymen. But not all hope is lost, being that he is one of the, the few lucky men to make it home, and at least he probably nicked a replacement toilet for himself in Ukraine. Then headed across to a quick funny to round it all off for today, guys. So Russia's Ural Airlines confirmed that their Airbus A320 plane, well, remember that Russian commercial A320 plane that was forced to perform an emergency landing in Siberia due to a lack of proper maintenance on the aircraft as a result of sanctions on Russia? Don't worry, everybody on the plane was okay. Well, the airline now say they've decided to ditch their plans of rescuing the plane due to the high costs and logistical challenges because it's not close to any runways and it's too expensive to get the necessary parts or even make a runway either. Not to mention, they also said they've already spent about 10 million rubles, which actually isn't really that much anyway, on its upkeep. Plus they put a fence around it to stop looters, which would steal the plane's high-pressure toilet if they got the chance. 
Plus they had to pay the, the landowner to rent the space as well. But if Russia never invaded Ukraine, they would never have had the sanctions that pretty much caused this event in the first place, as they were economically sanctioned on the maintenance parts, causing many of their Western supplied planes to fall into disrepair. So I'm sure that Russian private airliners now, who illegally hold at least Boeing and Airbus planes, are proactively cannibalizing the hell out of their existing and remaining Western portions of their fleet, until they really have nothing left. So that's it for today guys, uh, like and comment and all of those nice things, and check out my Juzzy News TV channel in the link below, especially for if my channel gets hacked, then you know where to find me too. So thanks again, and I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.